All right, so what we're going to do this morning is use our potter's house time to uh, further uh, amend or kind of add an addendum to our Gnostic Watch or <laughs> Gnostic Watch Weekly that we're doing every uh, Friday and posting at 7 uh, p.m. And um, since, it, since it is pre-recorded, we're going to use the Potter's House this morning to add a little addendum to it because Friday was more or less kind of a rough introduction in that when you're discussing Gnosticism, if you're not extremely careful in, in what you say, you can, you can just really get you know, to, to a point of no return. Um, Gnosticism is a very uh, simple, basic concept, and we discussed that Friday, but its applications are myriad. And uh, a lot of the confusion with denominations and different takes on what the Bible states is really boils down to this uh, an application of the same concept of everything material is evil, only the invisible is good, and uh, either by a cosmic force, natural force, force of nature, or a god, or the god, um, a minority of men or women on earth are preordained by some force to lead those who are enslaved to interpreting reality through the five senses. Okay? Um, yes. Okay, when you say, I guess this is the Gnostic know-how channel, uh, when you say only the invisible is good, mm -hmm. all right, people are going to immediately latch on to that word invisible. Right. There are all kinds of invisiblenesses in the world. Gravity is mm -hmm. invisible. So, mm -hmm. wind is invisible. Mm -hmm. uh, inertia is invisible. Mm -hmm. uh, wisdom and intuition and um, those other precepts and concepts mm -hmm. are invisible. So what is the Gnostic definition of invisible? Is it the invisible spiritual? Mm -hmm. As in there is a God force, a spiritual force, a cosmic force that is good, such as what Plato believed Mm -hmm. um, a consciousness, a cosmic consciousness that is only good, from which derives all good reality. In this, well, again, where you get into the where you get into the complications of it is even that is going to have varied definitions. All right, Luther and the Heidelberg Disputation. Uh, uh, narrowed it down to what he called the invisible. The invisible, which versus he, the material. So Luther referred to the invisible. Was that the Holy Spirit, or was that God the Father? Because uh, no man has seen God at any time. The Holy Spirit is invisible. Christ at one time was visible and material. He is. If we go there, it, it's a point, and this is the problem that you get into discussing Gnosticism. Just to go there leads is a whole other body of doctrine that falls under Gnosticism, and uh, this is the problem with defining Gnosticism and 
coming out against it or fighting it, for lack of a better term. So the invisible then is better described as the spiritual. Yes. So, however, now I'm going to play the devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. The invisible, only the invisible is good, but there is the invisible spiritual that is also demonic. That cannot be good. Well, now you're into a whole different body of uh, again, uh, another body of theology or doctrine um, that's a whole nother st study in and of itself. Okay, if the material is evil and but the spiritual is good, what about um, invisible spirits such as Satan and so on and so forth? Uh, with Luther and Gnosticism in general, you're looking at a whole other body of study now. The, where we are starting is the whole thing uh, with Luther that it focuses on man's ability to know reality. All right, And that's where John Emmel keeps a lot of his focus. Can the common man know reality? Okay? Uh, and the answer to that, certainly with Luther and Western uh, philosophies, is no. So basically, we're keeping our discussion of Gnosticism and how it pertains to the contemporary church and the church throughout history, we're keeping the, um, the subject narrowed to spiritual caste. Spiritual caste. What is spiritual caste? Well, the great unwashed masses, common man, has an inability to know truth and know reality. All right? God, therefore, let's just say God. Okay. It could be a force. All right? Uh, it could be nature, all right, a cosmic force, you know, the invisible, you know, whatever. It could be any of those things. Um, um, you know, somehow preordains or predetermines by natural selection or whatever a minority of uh, philosophers who are able to uh, ascertain uh, reality. Maybe not perfectly, but certainly these are people who are gifted to, to know Plato's trinity. Mm -hmm. All right, Plato had his own trinity, the good, true, and beautiful. All right, now let me build on that a little bit. And again, being very careful not to get other places. Plato, uh, Plato's true, good, and beautiful were immutable forms, okay. unchanging, all right? There's a popular, not, well, not a popular, a uh, reformed blog entitled Truth Unchanging. Oh, well, you know, that's the Gnostic principle of truth never changes. Why is the Reformed camp so, you know, you bring up, uh, you bring up uh, oh, dispensationalism. Mm -hmm. The idea that God dealt with man throughout history in different economies or different plans, mm -hmm. okay? God's plan unfolds through different covenants. Why does that idea just make the blood vessels start popping out in their neck, man, and they go crazy? Because you're talking about a truth that changes. One of the principles of, primary principles of Gnosticism, at least many of its veins, are that um, truth, Plato's good, true, and beautiful, is immutable is immutable, okay? Um, 
as biblicists looking at the Bible grammatically, i.e. words mean things, we say truth does change. Okay? Truth does change. Um, Plato believed no truth uh, and the reality of the material cannot be true, good, and beautiful because it's ever-changing. People get older, the seasons change, people die, stuff's moving around all the time, okay? So all of this is just shadows of the true forms, and man lives in the shadows. Socrates and Plato absolutely detested people who thought they could understand reality through studying the material, okay? Or what can be understood with the five senses. Plato had a disdain for people who believed that, okay? Um, so, this is spiritual caste, and the, the people who are preordained, predeterminism or determinism, is part and parcel of spiritual caste, which makes the whole infatuation with determinism and election with the reformed camp suspect. Because determinism and predeterminism is a very ancient concept. Okay, a caste system, mm -hmm. the very um, term castes, as we're familiar with the Hindu caste system, uh, the Brahmin, the untouchable, mm -hmm. right. and all of this. When you say a spiritual caste system, what are the levels of that? I know we have the quote philosopher kings, which mm -hmm. are our pastor, teacher, mm -hmm. know it all, whatever, the, mm -hmm. the educated seminarians, whatever mm -hmm. term you want to give it. What are the other levels of the spiritual caste mm -hmm. system? You, because you use this frequently in your writings and in your talk. Mm -hmm. So, in order to uh, Define this term that you use when we talk about Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. Let's define what you mean by spiritual caste system. Okay. With Plato, let's start with Plato. Plato was the philosopher king. Mm -hmm. The warrior. Right. And uh, the producer. The producer. Mm-hmm. Um, now... This is also Plato's trifold soul of man. Mm -hmm. Okay? Every man in his heart is a philosopher king, a warrior, and a producer or an artisan. The artisan works with his hands, he contributes to society. The warrior. Uh, enforces the will of the uh, philosopher king. Right. Okay? This is why, if, you know, De Sousa, you know, talks about all through human history um, the, the, the concept of conquering. Conquest. Yeah. Conquest, thank you. This is what drives it. What drives that conquest? What drives that conquest? The belief that your philosopher kings of your tribe really know what's going on. And for the betterment and really survival of the rest of the world, the will of your particular philosopher kings must be enforced on the whole world for the sake of the world. Now, what Plato believed, all right, and frankly he got it from the Hindu, Hindus, any Hindu scholar that is, that is worth his salt will tell you that uh, Platonism's, um, you know, Platonist metaphysics is a mirror of Hinduism, okay? And when they say Hinduism is the um, 
the most ancient religion of the world, that is absolutely true. Because Hinduism uh, is post-garden. All right, and as we discussed in our first talk, we see the 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 um, the very principles presented uh, in the garden by serpent, the basic principles of ancient spiritual caste. What are what are those? The knowledge of good and evil. All material is evil. The spiritual, only the spiritual is good. Okay, and the human mediator. Let's boil it down to human mediator. Okay, Satan, you only think you know what God said. You really need moi to tell you what God really meant when he said what he said. This is the very, before then, God spoke with Adam and Eve face to face. And he did after that as well. Okay? I strongly suspect, even though I wouldn't be dogmatic about it, this is why when God created the world, he created something and he said, it is good. It is good. It is very good. All right? I have a sneaking suspicion that that's why God otherwise is stating the obvious. Of course, anything God creates would be good. Okay? So, um, you have this very basic concept then of the knowledge of good and evil, and the, and the applications of the knowledge of good and evil are absolutely vast. But, it primarily boils down to dualism, which is all material is evil, only the invisible is good, and opposites define each other. Well, um, we wouldn't know what light is if it wasn't for darkness and vice versa. Now, again, this is sanctified, this is sanctified uh, hypothesis here, okay? Back when you and I, shortly after you and I got married and we were doing family devotions with Phillips and whatever friend was the friend of the day, okay, or girlfriend of the day, we did a study in the book of Genesis and we looked at a careful examination of the initial words in Genesis is that God... Um, this is a thumbnail. It looks like to me, and I leave plenty of room for being corrected here, I, I find it particularly interesting that God creates light and darkness, okay? But he, he separates the light and the darkness, or the light from the darkness. And I looked at those verses backwards and forwards and, and said, you know, at some point in time, uh, it appears that light and darkness were the same thing. Mm -hmm. Wow, what would that look like? So, grammatically, we have this body of water that has a face. And... Um, this body of water is suspended in light and darkness as one. And then God separates the light from the darkness. Okay, now, Andy's probably going to listen to this and do a word study. He's our word study guy. And he's probably going to do a Hebrew word study and then email me and correct me. And that's fine. Okay, that's fine. All right, but at the time we had this study, I looked at this really, really, really close. If my assertion, however, is true, it, it's it's peculiar to me that would would you know that coupled with with um, you know this whole emphasis on God creating something and saying it's good. 
okay, that what he created that could be perceived as material creation was deemed good. So what am I saying here? I am saying that spiritual caste i.e. what ends up being Gnosticism, all right, with many, you know, Gnosticism being basic spiritual caste with a myriad of different applications, um, is the crux of the whole issue, sort of like the, the declaration of the doctrine of, or do, uh, kingdom of darkness, so to speak, their paramount religion uh, it seems to be spiritual caste. And it all goes from there. Now, if I can find my way back from this rabbit track I just got on, and again, this is the danger of getting into this discussion, bring me back to where we were. You were telling me the stages of a spiritual cast. Ah, thank you. Yes. Okay. So, back to Plato. All right. And he did get this from the Hindus. All right. The human soul is made up of these three divisions. The philosopher king, the um, warrior, the warrior and, the and the artisan or the producer. Okay. Um Man's threefold heart also reflects society. All right? Society, this is Plato's metaphysical math problem for a just society. The goal of Plato and the Sophists was a just society. Okay? Now, quick aside. Their definition of justice was unity, period. Wherever there's unity, if a just society has unity, that's a just society. Justice is defined by unity. Okay? Regardless of which caste has to give up freedoms, rights, whatever, in order for there to be unity. Uh -huh. uh, and, and that is his definition of that. And this is the soul of collectivism. Right. And a um, a um, natural result or a tenet of collectivism is, and we're going to discuss that in some of our papers here, is... Uh, a, a tenet of collectivism, first let me define collectivism, okay? Collectivism is the individual's sole purpose of life. It is defined by what they can contribute to the group or society. The group is a good Platonist definition, okay? We were in an evangelical church not all that long ago. We weren't married yet. It's a wonder we did get married because I was popping your bubbles left and right all over the place. And I'm, I'm sitting in this sermon and the guy keeps on this evangelical, independent, Baptist guy, garb Baptist guy, kept on referring to the group. The group. So, reading, being a reader of Plato, that term made me start paying attention. And you're sitting there going, man, doesn't this sound good? Don't you think this is good? What do you think? And I'm like, it's in your face Platonism. Okay? It's very subtle. All the labels have been switched. So anyway, each man has this trifold soul with those three persons in him, you know, the uh, philosopher king, the warrior. But in each individual, 
one of those three characteristics are dominant. So the philosopher king is going to have a little bit of producer in him. And, um, you know, if you're married to a philosopher king, he can probably take that, he can probably take out the trash, but he can't fix the kitchen sink. <laughs> okay? Um, and a warrior, you know, you're going to have a little bit of philosopher king in you. You're going to have a little bit of artisan in you. Um, uh, even the producer is going to have a little bit of philosopher king in him. Okay? So this is where the philosopher kings let the artisans or the producers kind of have their fun with blogs and opinions and things of that sort. Okay? Um, but what Plato believed, which is in fact what the Hindus believed also, uh, because it's the same model, it's the same spiritual caste model. Um, society, the soul of society is a mirror of this. So when everybody is functioning per what characteristic is dominant in their soul, when they're functioning according to that, each individual is going to be happier and there's going to be unity in the society. Okay? Now, stop right there. This is what makes everything tick in the world. This is what makes Democrats tick. Okay? Uh, and you are asking me some questions on the way, some very good questions on the way over here. And basically it boils down to this, and it's going to boil down to this with people that are listening. How does this work in real life? And that is that look on that face. The question is always going to be the question and the demeanor of the asking person who interprets the world grammatically. Okay? Um, in other words... That's a door over there. And we know it's a door because that's the metaphysical label that we attach to that door. That's a door. Now, you go try to explain a door to somebody, but you're not allowed to use the word door. Okay? Even if you explain it, well, it's flat, but it's sitting up vertical, and it's in the middle of uh, a wall, you know, Let's say that we have a metaphysical label for walls, W-A-L-L-S, okay? Still, you can explain what the door looks like to the individual, but here's where you get into a problem. Even the doorknob and the chain link locks and the window panes and the glass itself and the hinges that all, you have to have metaphysical labels for all of that before you can ex explain what the door is. God created the world to be interpreted grammatically. Prove it. <clears throat> In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. All right. Heaven and earth, all right? Um, God created this, and each time God creates something, it has a name. Then he comes along, and he, he even lets Adam partake in metaphysics, right? He let him name all the anim animals, okay? God attaches a name to everything that he creates in Genesis, um, God said. That was the word I was getting ready right? to interject. And God said, He gave it, let there be light, and there was light. So He, he named it and it right. came to be. Now people, people, uh, this whole grammatical interpretation of reality 
is the antithesis of Gnosticism. Okay? Um, because enable, when you're able to interpret things grammatically, when you're able to interpret things grammatically, and the words mean all the same to everybody, guess what? Everybody's in the game. Level playing field. Okay? That's why, that's why they made Socrates drink hemlock. Alright? Because Socrates said knowledge of the universe was intuitive within every person. And the, the rulership in Athens, you know, you're talking at a time when 90% of the population in Athens were was serf or slaves, they're like, whoa, this is a really bad idea. <laughs> You're telling the general populace that they're on the same intellectual level as we are, or metaphysical level as we are. Sock, that's, that's a really bad idea. We need you to, to rethink this. And of course, the way they interpreted all that, he was brought up on charges for uh, leading the youth astray. Okay? Now, um, so, Socrates is executed, okay? Plato and the, his followers get out of Dodge, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is extreme thumbnail here. So they get out of Dodge and Plato hangs out with the Hindus a while mm -hmm. over in Asia and places, well, he really India. Travels to Egypt and, right. and quite a few other places, Iraq, Iran. Got into numerology. Why was numerology extremely important to um, Plato? Because it's unchanging. Yeah, mathematics, he was very... Right. You know, so something that doesn't change, that mm -hmm. is immutable, is fair game. Because if truth is immutable, and you've got a principle that is here on earth that is immutable, or unchangeable, that's got to lead you to the to at least some of the true good and beautiful. Okay, so um, Plato's over hanging out with people. I guess he uh, became a, a exchange student mm -hmm. to the smoke cleared in Athens, right? Mm -hmm. And he's like, okay, this is a better idea. Only a small group of people. Can, can know the true good and beautiful. I'll take that back to Athens. Everybody was happy. He started the academy. One of his students ended up being Aristotle. He said, no, 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 I'm not buying into this. And basically what Aristotle comes up with as an antithesis changes the whole world and eventually leads to America, okay? Uh, the framers of the Constitution of the of, of United States were were without a doubt Aristotelites and not Platonist. Okay, the two are uh, antithesis to each other. Okay, so and by the way, aside dangerous aside here, <clears throat> in the smoke-filled back rooms of Reformed theology, where they enjoy an occasional cold, good cold German beer, okay, the, 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 the debate and the theological conversation is very much Plato and Aristotle, okay. Um, that comes out every now and then in sermons and so forth, but really all of this debate and neo-Calvinism and whatnot, that let me make, as you know I do, make an extreme statement to make a point, okay? The argument really boils down to a great degree, Aristotle versus Plato, okay? In fact, the Puritans, when they landed, uh, the Puritans in colonial times were known as uh, Christian Platonists by the framers of the Constitution. Um, James Madison, I believe, 
and referred to them as such specifically. That's what they were known as. So, at any rate, everybody's got uh, the dominant characteristic in the soul of man is what you are. That's your place in society. And if you fulfill your place in society, not only will you be happier uh, as an individual, but uh, society will be much better off to the degree that everybody is functioning according to what their destiny is. Okay? Um, this is why, especially in medieval European history and many other places in history, especially the Middle East, Oh, upward mobility, upward mobility, upward mobility is the unpardonable sin. Um, still, in places, many places in the world, if you marry out of your particular caste strata, it's a capital crime. All right. Um, yes. In colonial times, it was against the law to dress like somebody who was not of your uh, station in life or caste level. And like I said, in, um, in colonial times, uh, here in the United States, it was, uh, you know, a hefty fine for getting caught dressing like somebody from another caste level, in some cases, jail time. All right? Frippery and finery, it was called. Huh, yeah. So, basically, that's what you, that's what you have. Okay, I want to interrupt you, because mm -hmm. you've gone down several little good rabbit trails. What okay. would be the equivalent in a church, in a spiritual caste system, to the philosopher king? The pastor. What would be equivalent to the warrior? Deacons. And then the artisan and the producer would be the pew sitters. The pew sitters. The members. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought, but that would be... But So when you speak of spiritual caste system in our churches, this is what you're referring to. Pastors, elders slash deacons in some churches, and church members. Right. And um, that's why the, the church functions the way it does. Okay? That's why the church... Now, in the Catholic Church, in the Catholic Church, this varies from time to time, but the Catholics, Rome, kind of split up the philosopher king Okay, the popes were really um, the the popes were the kings, the monks were the philosophers. Of course, they had their own standing army, and then of course you had the producers. So what R Roman Catholicism uh, has done throughout the history is really split up the philosopher king into king and philosopher. The monks were the philosophers. Now what do we know about monks? Monasteries and an aversion to the material. So basically the monks got the dope, okay, and gave it to the popes and then the popes enforced it. Alright, but the sole purpose of the monk was to, to um, get away from society, uh, get away from the material, get in a monastery, and do what? Contemplate. Okay? Um, if I remember, Pope Gregory, yes, Pope Gregory despised the fact, Pope Gregory was a monk, he despised being drafted as a pope because he didn't he didn't want to be a king he wanted to be a philosopher okay and he he 
did it because that's what everybody wanted him to do. But it wasn't where his heart was. His heart was being in the monastery, undistracted by the material worlds mm -hmm. and all its trapping, trappings, to where he could partake in prayer and medica um, meditation. As far as I can tell, Pope Gregory, as a monk, is the one who really first comes up with what we know today as the redemptive historical um, hermeneutic where all of reality is interpreted through uh, Christ's suffering on the cross. All of reality is defined through, through the cross in Christ's suffering on the cross. Okay? So, basically, I hope that's all helpful. Well, you've given us a good thumbnail, uh, historically. Mm -hmm. um, that I encourage people to really uh, read up on Plato and what mm -hmm. Plato believed. It's a real eye-opener in regard to what's going on even in the, the church and in what New Calvinism and the history of New Calvinism and the influence that Plato Plato had on Augustine and Calvin and mm -hmm. Luther. And yet we hold these men up on high pedestals, mm -hmm. Augustine and Calvin and Luther, and we uh, don't look at where they got their ideas. I want to reiterate, Plato was a pagan. He did not believe in God, even though there are some pastors who say that Plato was a pre-Christian Christian. Mm -hmm. The Catholics believed that he was a pre-Christian Christian mm -hmm. because he had this trinity, which was the true, the good, and the beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, they said that referred to his concept of God, and, um, and everything flowed from that. Um, so they, they really referred to Plato as a pre-Christian Christian, and therefore they can give a stamp of approval to some of his philosophical ideologies. But people need to realize that Plato was a pagan. He was not, uh, back in the day, he was not a believer in Yahweh. Mm -hmm. um, was he a deep thinker? Was he an intellectual? Mm -hmm. Was he a philosopher that really opened the door from barbaric thinking and getting, provoking people to think? Yes, we can congratulate him on that, that he provoked people to think. Um, his students were provoked to think. And, and because of him, we have some of the higher levels of mathematics today because he provoked Aristotle right. to think literally, quote, outside the box. Right. And, uh, so I don't want to degrade Plato for the good ideas that he had. But I want people to realize when they elevate him and call him a pre-Christian Christian, and mm -hmm. Augustine builds his entire Catholic doctrine mm -hmm. on his beliefs. Right. And Calvin builds his entire institutes on Augustine's right. philosophy. Quoting Calvin, I am of Augustine, he is in me, I am of him. Um, and this is irrefutable history. Irrefutable. I am not making it up or stretching it. You can read these for yourself in Calvin's Institute. And then Luther the same way. Right. Well, Luther was an Augustinian monk. And, well, uh, and so the, and the whole the whole idea is is we I want to caution people that when they give a stamp of approval on mm -hmm. philosophy and on philosophers and on men. They need to look here in God's Word and see if they are in total agreement with the inspired Word of God. And right. if they are not, then they are not to be elevated. Right, and, and um, here's the thing. Both the Reformers 
and Catholics both claim Augustine as the doctor of their theology and their doctrine. Augustine said plainly that Plato was the precursor to Christianity. He, he made no bones about it. He said, without Plato, I could not understand the Pauline epistles. Right. So, basically, um, basically, this boils down to, in the church today, let's bring it down to the church today, 90% of the pastors out there in the institutional church, okay, uh, and... Uh, are redemptive historical in their interpretation of the Bible. Whereas most parishioners are grammatical. Why? Because uh, that's what comes naturally. Alright? Of course, as created beings of God, our natural bent is to interpret reality grammatically. What Plato, Augustine, Luther, and Calvin wants us to do is um, get away from that. And know that, as Rick Holland has said in his book, Uneclipsing the Sun, good grammar makes bad theology. <laughs> okay? What's he saying when he says that? Alright? Um, okay, so, with that, Let's just give one good example of, uh, from all of these good articles here, because I know we've talked length, at length here. Mm -hmm. Can we find one good example of um, something that really reflects Gnostic thinking in a contemporary pastor or a contemporary writer? Um, well, we can, and uh, this is an article that best fits what we're discussing, and this is right off the Southern blog, Southern Seminary's blog, and this is an article written by David Prince, who is a Southern Baptist pastor of a church and is... Um, serves as Assistant Professor of Christian Preaching at Southern Seminary. Mm -hmm. um, he is also the, listen, you ready? He is the Pastor of Preaching and Vision at Ashland Avenue Baptist Church. What is a Pastor of Preaching and Vision? Okay, uh, let me explain that. A, Vision. What do you mean, a pastor of vision? Okay, as we have explained before, okay, um, faith in the philosopher king and a definition of faith, according to Plato, is this whole idea of um, how we experience reality. It's experiencing reality, it's seeing reality, but it's not doing reality. Okay. Reality is something that is done to you, but you don't do reality. Okay? If you do reality, if you can invent an iPhone, if you are Steve Jobs, you are creating your own reality. You are making yourself a god. Okay? Um, but, I'm getting into, again, a whole different body of um, a study here. Look, the definition of faith in this context, let me give you a definition of faith. Uh, Martin, or Martin Luther and John Calvin's definition of faith, and I assume Augustine as well. Faith is like an eye. Faith is like an eyeball that only sees out. Okay, at any given point to where we think the eye of faith or the vision of faith can see inward, chaos and subjectivism abounds. Okay, um, faith must only see out, and as our heart is transformed, we see the world for what it is. 
This was the premise of the book written by David Pallison, uh, something like Sing with New Eyes or something. Okay, this is what this is all about. All right, now, um, the name of this article is We Need Fools in the Pulpit, The Danger of Sophisticated Ministry. Um, I think we have enough fools in the book, but we don't need any more fools. Okay, <laughs> this all has to do with the redemptive historical construct, the Platonist construct of the quote. Here we go. This is right out of the Heidelberg Disputation. Here, were you ready? The quote, foolishness of the cross as a hermeneutic. This is what this is all about. Um, truisms, uh, pithy truisms to go along with. Jesus is a person, not a precept. Okay? The list could go on and on and on. Okay? Um, but you had something underlined in there. In well, there. I've, I've been slashing and hashing, but uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, the end of the first paragraph, because he's referring to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, right. where he says that, well, let's just turn there. We don't find 1 Corinthians 2, 2. And we have been doing an, an ex pretty exhaustive study in the book of Romans, and, and, and also with Andy Young in Acts, mm -hmm. and um, this is where I really beg to disagree with this man. He is saying, 1 Corinthians 2, 2. But if I make you sorry, who is he then that makes me glad, but the same who is made sorry by me? Okay. Paul was contending that the power and wisdom of God on display in the cross and the resurrection of Christ served as the only proper framework. Well, that, excuse me, that didn't make sense. That's because that was 2 Corinthians. Hang on. I wonder why that looked confusing to me. 1 Corinthians 2.2 2. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Right. Okay. Paul was contending that the power and wisdom of God on display in the cross and resurrection of Christ served as the only proper frame of reference for every single thought. There you have it. I couldn't say it any better myself. All of reality is interpreted through the cross right. and suffering. Luther and his Heidelberg Disputation associated any kind of work with man with the material, which was evil. If you see, if you see a Boy Scout run out in the street, push a little old lady out from uh, in front of a Mack truck that's about ready to run her over in the crosswalk and sacrifices himself to the Mack truck, okay, um, to save the little old lady. That has to be an evil act. Why? Because it's of the material world. All right. Nothing done in the material world can be good. Only the invisible can be good. And Luther states in his Heidelberg Disputation, of course I'm heavily paraphrasing, since man was hell-bent on thinking that there is good works that can be seen and, uh, and experienced in the material world, God then sends His Son, Jesus Christ, to show forth all reality in suffering on the cross. So, the classic statement by Martin Luther in the Heidelberg Disputation is, all wisdom in God is hidden in the suffering of the cross. Okay? All of the wisdom of God is hidden 
in the suffering of the cross. Okay? How does this come out in contemporary times? Well, it comes out wittingly or unwittingly with John MacArthur uh, during a Q&A at a conference saying that the primary reason that, that Christians doubt their salvation is because they haven't suffered enough. Okay? He said it. Right there. But right. this is where I... And I mean, you, you've probably heard my Bible pages rustling as you're talking here. Mm -hmm. He says that the power and wisdom of God on display in the cross mm -hmm. and the resurrection of Christ is the only proper frame of reference for every single thought. But I'm mm -hmm. slipping through 1 Corinthians mm -hmm. and... Um, In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he talks about, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. But then I go to another chapter, chapter mm -hmm. 3 of this letter, and he's saying uh, on and on, uh, for you, you are bought with a price, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Uh, He's not talking about Christ's crucifixion there. Right. He's talking about living with the sanctified Christian life here. He's right. talking about kingdom living now. You're, you're arguing what he's saying from a grammatical perspective. See? And see, and then in, in, and then in chapter 9, he continues on with sanctification here and says, Every man that yeah. strives is temperate in all things. Paul doesn't frame everything with the cross and the resurrection of Christ. Mm -hmm. he, now here's he what he just framed that one verse. He introduced right. himself. He said, "I humbly come before you. I'm determined right. not to know not not to know anything among you, but to present to you the gospel of Jesus Christ and then what you're supposed to do with that gospel. Okay. Move on in your Christian walk. But here's what he would say. He would say the same thing that Paul David Tripp says, and I would recommend to everybody reading the book, How People Change. Because Paul David Tripp um uh, has great statements in there that brings all of this out. Let me paraphrase one for you. In regard to what you just said, indeed, the Bible does in, uh, have imperatives and does command us to do things and not do things. Indeed. But, even with the commands of the Bible, those commands must be seen in their gospel context. This guy would just look at you and say, Susan, I don't disagree with you. Yeah, Susan, that's what Paul plainly says. I, I agree, but, Susan, okay? <clears throat> the question, Susan, is, is what we emphasize. Okay, the question, Paul, is what is your definition of gospel? Well, See, this is this is the other underlying thing. The definition of gospel is defined as the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But God's word says the gospel is this entire book. It's, it is the law of God. I understand. The written word is the gospel. But that under, is the good news. Understand where they win the argument in a Sunday school class, and you get shot down immediately. Here is an article written by um, one of the members of the Australian Forum, okay, and, and part of the core four was Graham Goldsworth, who is the poster board boy for contemporary uh, redemptive uh, historical hermeneutics. The False Gospel of the New Birth. In this article, Jeffrey Paxton says, we're not saying there, there isn't a new birth. Of course there's a new birth. Of course there's a new birth. But you're making the 
the, uh, you're making a good thing the best thing. Okay. Now, what, what are they, what are they saying? And everybody listen, because this is the crux. What are they saying? They're saying, Susan, you're trying to interpret truth by the shadows. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, Susan, grammatically, okay, empirically, that's what the Bible says. But Susan, those are the shadows. Okay? Uh, the empirical and the grammatical is the shadows. Okay? Of course shadows are true. But Susan, the real essence of transformation, what is really going to transform our heart, is seeing the cross in those verses. Okay? Not precepts. And your answer to that would be? My answer with that would be what John Emil finally got into my head. And what I'm telling everybody out there, you got to stop arguing with these people. Let me put it to you this way. I'm in a Sunday school class. And this guy says what he says in Sunday school class. I raise my hand. Okay? And when he calls on me, I don't call him out. I don't isolate his statement here and show scriptures that contradict it. Here's what I say. Um, I disagree with you, not because of what the Bible says grammatically. I disagree with you based on your interpretation of reality being totally different from me. Now people in the Sunday school class are going, what? Because what they're used to is scripture stacking. So basically, I raise my hand and I say, I want to disagree with what you said and I'll be gracious about it, but I, I've got a disagreement and maybe you can help me with it, okay? I disagree with you because you and I interpret reality in two different ways. And basically, I'm a person sitting here under your teaching, and you and I interpret reality, both professing Christians, you and I interpret reality in two different, different, total different ways. So therefore, after I make my statement, I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna take my family and leave. You know why? Because there's no, me sitting, me and my family, or my family and I, whichever is correct, okay? This is a total waste of time for us to be sitting under your teaching because we interpret reality totally differently from how you interpret reality. You interpret reality redemptively, okay? Um, all reality is interpreted through suffering Okay, an empirical observation is the shadows. Okay, it's shadows of the truth. And uh, when the sun or the Plato's brightness of the sun isn't emphasized, basically, and that's what you've got. You've got Plato's bright light, right. the, the good, true, and the beautiful, and you have the shadows. For you to argue from a grammatical position is to, to, here's what you've got. You've got the artisan arguing with the philosopher king with shadows. The philosopher king's going to go, <laughs> that's why you guys are so pathetic. You're enslaved to the shadows. Okay? So what Christians got to start doing they got to start calling these guys out and saying, Dear fellow members of said church, do you want to be a biblicist? Do you want to be a biblical grammarian? Or do you want to be a Platonist? If you want to be a Platonist, stay and be part and parcel with the institutional church. 
if you want to be a grammarian, uh, well, well, you know, then you've got Calvinists raising their hand who really aren't Calvinists, but say, well, we interpret the Bible grammatically, then why aren't you kicking all of these other bozos out of here? Okay? Which is a big, huge problem. I might be almost tempted to go back to the institutional church if grammar grammatical Calvinist would get a backbone and start calling out all of these Platonists. Okay? And flat out kick them out of the church. Alright? And, um, but the problem that you run into is um, the second you get into an institution uh, or a building, immediately the focus becomes that institution and not individual gifts. That's the problem you get into with an institution. Okay? You, you, the, the gravitation towards the, the institution being the focus is too strong. That's why real church is designed to be a home fellowship with uh, individual priests being led by those who have the gift of teaching who help them along the way. Okay? Uh, basically, I tweeted to, to, um, to uh, Matt Chandler this morning, and I said, you have no authority, nor has any authority been given unto you. Okay? Christ has been given all authority and gives gifts to the church. Christ gave no authority to the church. Christ has all the authority. Alright? We only have gifts and those gifts are practiced in the construct of fellowship, okay, uh, and the unity of one mind, and that is the one mind of Christ. Okay? Now, you've been an excellent facilitator in this discussion. What more can you add at, at the, to this point, or you think we've said enough for I think today? we've said enough, because if okay. I say what else, it'll go on for another hour. Uh, we've got plenty of material for next week, <laughs> next Friday.